Good evening, everyone, and wishing you all a very happy Mother's Day. Today, the world celebrates the Mother's Day, and uh, we all pay respects to uh, our mothers, all mothers on earth. And we are also meeting across the space, all over the country, and I'm very happy to be. Uh, talking to all of you, you had a wonderful uh, convocation, a meeting of uh, students from all across the country at Jabalpur. Unfortunately, I was not able to join you, though I had promised to do so. It's not an opportunity that I get today to be uh, with you. And we're all meeting at a very critical juncture in the whole, whole world. He is now facing the challenge of the COVID-19 and India is doing very well. We are all uh, fighting and taking all steps to contain the negative impact of COVID-19 and uh, we must continue to be diligent and disciplined. As you all know, the government and the Honorable Prime Minister have given a made a personal appeal to everybody in the country that we need to be extremely diligent so that we help ourselves we help the society at large so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity of being with you this uh, evening i had shared with you that i would be speaking on the theme of agriculture is the mother of the economy. I would therefore uh, dwell at length about how it was the mother of economy, how it is the mother of economy and how it shall be the mother of economy. If you s just look at the way government has responded during this particular crisis time, we all will appreciate that agriculture sector has been given several concessions from the lockdown protocols. The agriculturists have been allowed to take their rabi produce to the markets. The agriculturists have been allowed to undertake operations of Z crops, that is the summer crop. They have also been allowed to start preparing for the Kharif uh, production season. And what this means is that the farmers and the agricultural labor can make movements. It also meant that all the associated input transactions, be it fertilizers, organic manures, pesticides and other inputs can all be transacted. So this alone shows that even when we all need to be indoors to contain the negative impact of the unknown virus, agriculture sector has been given a concession that itself shows how critical agriculture is in the lives of our people in India and what a major contribution it makes to economy. And when we talk about contributions to the economy, we normally tend to look at what is the share of a sector like agriculture in the overall economy of the country. As long as we keep focus on this particular factor called gross domestic product, a gross value added as a share of the national economy, then somebody might say that agriculture is not that important. As you all know, today agriculture accounts for about 14.5% of the nation's GDP. What it shows is that though agriculture has grown up in terms of absolute contributions in terms of GDP, relative to other two important sectors of the economy, the industry and services, we are behind. Those two sectors have grown up. If you look at the last 70 years of economic growth history of India, while we were accounting for nearly 63% of the economy, economy, we are now come down. While the service sector has grown tremendously, industry has grown but not at the same pace as services. 
the point that I would like to drive home and you as young students of agriculture sciences must keep in mind that the best measure of appreciating any economic sector activity is just not GDP alone but more importantly what does it mean for the livelihoods of the people. In India with a huge population of 130 crore we have as high as 48% of our population depending on agriculture for their livelihood both directly and indirectly. When it comes to livelihood options that means it gives jobs, it generates incomes for this large section of our society. The importance of agriculture then stands up notwithstanding that its contribution to the GDP is relatively less. And this point I would like you to remember as we move ahead. When I say that agriculture is the mother of economy, I would like to take you back. I would like you to travel with me back into the history of the human civilization. Let's go back 10,000 years. That means around uh, the second century, I mean the 8,000 years before Christ. What happened with that? We all know that man's evolution happened. It's not that man was created. It was not a concept of somebody making a watch. It was an evolution. That means from the first simple single cell of amoeba, the life has evolved into different species. And finally, we have the highest evolution, the Homo sapien. Now the modern man, the Homo sapien that we all are, we started settling down around 10,000 years ago. It is said that there were at least five human species. The first human species came up on earth around 3.5 lakh years ago. From that 3.5 lakh years where we had four or five species, it was around 40,000 years ago that we had this one species, Homo sapien, left. But it took long time for even this modern man, Homo sapien, to travel through times and then settle down to a civilizational life around 10,000 years ago. Before that, for another 10,000, that means for 20,000 years before today, man was a hunter-gatherer. He was traversing through the forests, different landscapes. He was able to hunt animals, he was able to see crops, identify crops that were able to produce certain edible commodities, gather them, consume them and live. But as he did this, he also realized it is possible for us to domesticate some animals, domesticate certain crops. And that was around 10,000 years ago. So as man learned to manage the crops and animals, it gave birth to the first settlement. And we all must be also very proud to understand and remember that of the several hot spots on this earth where this kind of settled agriculture is happening, India is one of the prime hotspots. The modern agriculture that started 10,000 years ago, let's call it the settled agriculture. It happened somewhere in today's Balochistan. And at the foothills in the Balochistan, the first seeds of barley, lentil were, were sown and grown. The first domestication of animals like goat and sheep happened. And parallelly, somewhere in Uttar, today's Uttar Pradesh, more precisely in today's Sant Kabir Nagar district, we also had wheat operations going on. So simultaneously, as you realize, across the Indus civilization, 
man was learning to practice domesticated agriculture which consisted of both crop husbandry and animal husbandry. So now you will be able to appreciate that with the domestication, with better management practices, man was able to produce food for his own consumption. Now he was also able to produce surpluses. When we have that kind of a surplus, we'll be able to have more population, settle houses and begin a new civilization. Civilization gives rise to culture, the way we live, the way we interface with one another, various rituals and practices. But then the point to note is that without agriculture they would not have a settled life, without settled life there would not be a civilization, without civilization there would be a culture. And this is what happened at that point of time, small hutments and then small villages, little bigger towns and we had the Indus Valley Civilization. Indus Valley Civilization or more commonly known as Mohenjo-daro Harappan Civilization stands at par with one of the, with, with all the ancient civilizations whether it is Mesopotamian or Egyptian or the Chinese. So Indus Valley Civilization from which we have rolled out like to this day, rolled down to this day, gives us a sense of pride. And agriculture and then its attendant activities, which mean cottage industries, which mean textiles and several other activities that support agriculture an agriculture that supports the growth of these small-scale cottage industries. These two together have sustained life in India for 10,000 years. And in 1850s they say that India along with China accounted for the major GDP of the world. So we are inheritors of that kind of a voluminous or high magnitude of gross domestic product which, which took us right to the top. It's a different history that you know what happened after the 1850s where the western world took to science and technology, education, mass awareness, they were able to overtake us. But for the, for the topic today it is important to know that we have all been sustained by agriculture and today agriculture is sustaining us. I explained to you at the very outset, if you look at the number of people dependent on agriculture for the livelihood, it is agriculture that has been sustaining. We also should remember that when we talk about agriculture, the common perception is that agriculture is meant to produce food. Yes, food is a basic requirement. If you all remember Maslow's need hierarchy theory, the basic and the fundamental requirement of life is to sustain our physique, keep our body and soul together. So biological requirement including food is the fundamental requirement and agriculture is providing for that. However, if we confine agriculture in terms of food production alone, whether it is crops or fruits or vegetables or livestock, meat, fish etc. There are several kinds of agriculture commodities. When we try to confine the entire gamut of agriculture within the framework of providing food to the people or providing fodder to animals, we will be doing injustice to agriculture. We will be doing a great injustice to our farmers. Agriculture produces raw materials. Those raw materials have fed a large number of industries. Textile, for example, which is next important, next in importance to agriculture in terms of people engaged. 
and it has been through civilizations. The textiles in India, in India through the centuries has grown linked to agriculture. It's cotton, it's jute and other kinds of fibers that our farmers produce. And that sector has provided employment. That sector has generated incomes for people, wealth for the country. What does all this show? It only shows that agriculture is a place where you can generate a variety of resources that will feed people, that will feed animals, that will feed industries and become the foundation of an economic growth of a country by simultaneously contributing to civilizational patterns. Now let's come to today. What has happened today? Let's look what has happened to agriculture in the last 70 years since independence. When we started our journey in 1947 and a planned development approach since 1951 when we adopted the first five plan, agriculture held this way. Large number of people depended on that. That was a major economic contributor. The industry and services sectors were yet to grow. And then we had, unfortunately, the food crisis in 1960s, early 1960s. Now, when we were to depend on other countries for securing basic food to the people of this country, we responded by adopting new technology. I will not go into that technology, you all know it's called a green revolution technology. But what is more important to be remembered is our farmers whom we call illiterate are not open to technology and new management practices. So does the same farmers in 1965 who adopted the new technology and management practices and by 1972 they gave food security to this country and this food security then enabled India to roll out other economic activities and thereafter for the next 50 years let's say 2010s where India became one of the major producers of food grains. India is also one of the major producers of agricultural produce. As students of agriculture science, always you must keep your mind open that agriculture is just not crop husbandry. Agriculture is as diverse as any other economic sector can be. Rather, it is more diverse. Agriculture has crops, field crops, several field crops. It is horticulture, several sub-segments within the horticulture. We have got plantation crops too under that. We have animal husbandry, several segments under animal husbandry. So fisheries, once again, several sub-segments under that. And then there are of course related activities. Now, when we look at agriculture wholesomely, and that's what I would like to, like to communicate to you, do not compartmentalize agriculture. It has to be looked at comprehensively and wholesomely. When you look at that wholesomely, you will start appreciating what Indian farmers are doing, whom we call as small and marginal farmers because they constitute 86% of our total farm population. Now, these farmers are producing 1.2 billion tons of agricultural produce. This includes food grains, of course, which now stands at around 287 million tons. We have got 315 million tons of fruits and vegetables and other horticulture produce. Our small marginal farmers 
landless farmers, mostly women who rear a goat or a sheep or a buffalo or a cow, they are contributing 171 million tons of milk in the, to the country. So if you take all these things, we have about 1.2 billion, 1200 million tons of agriculture produce. There are very few countries in the world who can boast of this high magnitude of agriculture produce. And there are fewer countries which can talk of a diversity of agriculture produce. Now our country geographically is blessed to a vast area. As a ratio, the net cultivated area is higher to the total geographical area compared to other countries. You have countries like Russia, USA, or Canada, or Australia, China, who have large geographical tract. But arable land is not so profuse in those countries as it is in India. We have about 141 million hectares of net cultivated area. And this advantage is complemented by the diversity of agroclimatic conditions. There are very few countries which can produce crops or other activities in two or three seasons in a year. We have three seasons. We have Kharif and Rabi, of course, and also we have got a summer, summer cropping production system. Because of this, we can increase 141 million hectares by a factor of K. And it is that factor K which we in normal language call it a cropping intensity. We should be able to enhance that if only we bring in science and technology. Science and technology for simplicity let's say that it reduces the crop growth season from 6 months to 4, 4 to 3, 3 to 2 or even 30 days which is possible. Science can do anything, any wonder. And supported by other kinds of technologies, say let's combine it with emerging technologies like information or internet of things or web of things or sensors, all kinds of new technologies which the IT has enabled today. If we are able to combine this thing, then we will be able to bring in modern management practices and say I can grow not just three crops in a year. I can possibly do four and five. And then now you all know about controlled production environment as symbolized by polyhouses, greenhouses, shade nets, where you can further control the temperature, the humidity, evaporate transpiration losses by using sensors and other kind of IT interventions. Or then look at, for example, hydroponics, aeroponics, the new technologies which are also beginning to catch up. The short point is that if we are able to bring science, technology based new management practices, we should be able to use the same land many a time in a year. With growing population, large number of people depend on agriculture. When horizontal growth is not possible, we will have to go vertically. Just as it is happening in city centers where now we are going for high rise buildings, we need to go for layers of agriculture production on the same given land. So when that happens, we will have still larger quantum of production in this country. Now you may ask, is larger production of agriculture commodities good for the country? Yes, it's good for the country because country has to meet the consumption requirements of people. Population also is growing. But if you now delineate further the important stakeholders relating to agriculture, we all will agree that farmer producers are a principal stakeholder. If an industrialist or an entrepreneur is running a business, running a service center, he is doing it because he wants to earn profits. If it cannot generate profits, then I think you will close the shop. As students of agriculture economics courses, you must have learned in the first course that 
we in any enterprise would like to maximize our profits or minimize the losses and that same principle which applies to any economic enterprise should also be applied to agriculture unless agriculture is practiced as an enterprise that means unless it is able to generate profit which means that the net output in terms of value to the money is more than what we have put in to the farming sector then that is not a profitable business therefore when you increase the total agriculture output do the farmers who are our principal stakeholders in this agricultural domain do they stand to benefit and that's the important question that you must ask ask answer now the country is expected to ask an answer is already asked and we are also giving answers now as you know the agriculture produce has to be converted into money in the market only when the markets are able to find remunerative prices for the agriculture produce the farmer will stand to benefit and simultaneously of course he has to reduce the cost of cultivation so that he is able to get more profits the point to remember is that the the prices that the farmers receive what they produce at the market is a matter of supply and demand and the basic economics again teaches us you go back to your basic course if the supply increases beyond a point beyond what the demand is the prices are bound to fall if the supply is low demand is more the prices are bound to increase and that's good for the farmers but today what is happening today the scene is that in several cases particularly food grains we are seeing a supply is more than the demand and account of which the farmers are not able to get remunerative prices for the produce at the market and when they don't get prices they are bound to lose that is the losing proposition simultaneously i would also like you to remember that fetching remunerative prices or good prices for the agriculture produced in the market is not the only not the only requirement for the farmers to make a profit as once again they say in economics getting good prices through a good price discovery mechanism is a necessary condition but not a sufficient condition let me illustrate if i have 10 quintals of jowar and i the two traders would come to me and one says i'll give you 4000 rupees per quintal but i'll buy only two quintals another trader comes and tells me i'm going to give you 3500 rupees per quintal but i'll pick up all your 10 quintals the common sense tells me and even if i get 500 rupees less on the two quintals that the trader number one wants to buy vis-a-vis -vis the second trader i'm going to lose 1000 for the first two quintals but i'm going to make money for the eight quintals what does it mean it only means that farmers must be able to reach the market where they can sell or the traders are able to reach the farmers where they can buy two basic requirements today is that we are able to connect all the agriculture produce or more appropriately what is called marketable surpluses with the markets so that we are able to convert that agriculture surplus into money and as we convert we also give him a good price a remunerative price so these two are required today so that the farmers are able to make more money on what they produce but why are we not able to do that so the challenge today is not 
the ability or the inability of the farmers to produce. Farmers are very good in adopting new technologies. Our scientists are very good in giving us new technologies. Government is excellent in giving policy support, which are the basic requirements. But what is more important is that our policies and programs, our science and technology must answer the specific requirements, which are the new challenges. Today, the requirement is not to just increase the productivity. What is required is how can we help the farmer to reach from his farm gate to the market. What does that mean? Let's say for example, we need good agri logistics. We need storages for perishables, for non-perishables. We need transport or conveyance system for perishables and non-perishables so that the market gets connected to the agriculture production center. Even after it gets connected, maybe they are not able to sell because there is not enough, there's not enough demand. The demand may arise tomorrow. That means there is a time value for the agriculture produce, not just the place value. How do we ensure that we are tapping the time value? That will come provided we are able to improve the shelf life. So now what do we need? The scientists and technology have to start working on improving the shelf life so that the quality of the produce does not get compromised in a short period of time as the produce travels from the farm gate over distance to larger places even outside the country. So that's very important and we need to focus on that. However, this alone is not going to help us. Why we do make efforts to ensure that our farm produce is being conveyed out from its production zone to the consumption zones whether within the country or outside the country. A time has arisen today where there are surpluses across the world, not just in India. Other countries are also producing. As long as going back to where I started, we circumscribe the role of agriculture to produce food grains for the people we will always have a situation of surpluses. How do we now check that sur surplus situation? There is what the necessity of reorienting agriculture to go beyond the mandate of producing food for people or the feed and fodder for our animals and say now agriculture shall be the new mind's feed. It shall be the new mind resource that will start feeding agro-industries. It will start producing and start connecting itself with producing intermittent goods which can then feed into the manufacturing sector. So in short what we are now speaking about is what is called a bioeconomy. A bioeconomy in simple words means that the industry sector, which has so far depended and continues to depend on carbon sources built over millions and millions of years, has to now start slowly shifting to this renewable form of resource production center. It is agriculture, including of course the forestry, which is capable of producing those kind of raw material which can go into agro-industry and then to produce intermediate commodities and then link it up with the manufacturing sector. This is where I think you were at the doctorate level and some of you at the PG level and some of you who already have moved out must start looking at new ways of making agriculture relevant to the modern economy. Modern economy of today and the modern economy of the tomorrow. Today we are living in a world fueled by technology where the only constant is change. And the way change is happening, the velocity of change is only gathering further moment, momentum. 
For took 1000 years, I told you for example how early man to move from hunting and gathering to settle agriculture took 10,000 years. And it took millions of years to become, to have evolved into a species of man. And then it took us 1000 years, 500 years, 100 years, even the, as recent as 19th century, it was taking us 50 years, 100 years to make a change. Today in the 21st century, it does not take one year, it sometimes just takes one day for to make a change. It's so difficult to keep pace with the changes that have happened. So what we need to do is, that if ultimately the goal of life is to derive happiness, and that happiness is going to come from meeting all the requirements of man, not, not at the basic level, but at the higher level. So once again, let me depend or let me recall, because there are many definitions of what this happiness could be. But as students of science, let's define it in a more tangible form. The only tangible way I can share with you is to fall back upon Maslow's need hierarchy theory. He identifies five requirements or five rungs of the ladder of life. The first one of course, as I told you, the physical requirement. Then he requires social security. Then he needs what is called a sense of recognition and achievement. Then moving forward, he is calling for what is called self-actualization. That means he wants to do what he wants to do. But higher the run you climb, more resources you need in terms of value, money, etc. The society should be able to produce all that. So today what is India, what is the world facing, not just India? We have tried 200 years of industrial revolution based on power. Earlier the steam power, electric power, atomic power, all kinds of powers, but mostly they were all using the carbon-centric resources. What has happened? The fast pace of use of these resources has all caused a shake-up in the climate. It has turned it upside down and we call it as climate change. Climate change, which is highly visible today, it is now causing disturbances in the temperature, in the rainfall and the weather extreme frequencies. So I would not like to bore you with what happens when this kind of uncertainty of weather and climate patterns happen. Only we should remember that our yields are going to be affected. Whether it is on the land or in the water, wherever it is, it is going to be impacted. We therefore need to shift to renewable form. That means it's an advantage to the mankind. That if we can shift from carbon-based fossil resources to renewable form of resources that are grown on the agriculture fields and in the forests, then it is all the more good for us, good for the society and more importantly for you and me concerned with farmers, good for our farmers. Why? Because now the farmers will be oriented, supported by new science and technology and policy support to move away just from food production to producing raw materials that feed the industrial energy plants. When that happens, even though we will have more productivity and therefore more production, the nature of the production of the basket of agricultural commodities will undergo such a change that we will now start finding new markets. The basic requirement of any enterprise, including agriculture, is that we should be able to find a market for what to produce. For example, if the car manufacturer doesn't find a demand, he will shut the shop, at least for one day, two days, one month, one year if required. Likewise, agriculture has to find continuously a market 
by diversifying its production system, by differentiating its production system, and then always finding out what market wants and producing. So what does it mean? Not farm to folk, but folk to farm. I first gather intelligence of what the markets want tomorrow and day after next year. And accordingly I change my production system. But I as a farmer need to be supported by science and technology to do that stuff. So now as I said, if we want to correct the market situation and overcome the problem of oversupply and therefore be in sync with the demand and reach a price equilibrium, what we need to do is to find or grow those kind of produce. The problem that India is facing today because of surpluses, this happened likewise in many other countries and a few other countries. Let's take America, USA. In 1984, they suddenly found that the market prices are falling. And then they had a brainstorm with experts and professionals. The Minister of Agriculture there called for a special meeting. And he said, our farmers are suffering. What do we do? <clears throat> they constituted a committee. And what came out of that was, that we now need to reorient agriculture to meet the needs of industries. And then they found out what kind of materials can be produced linked to agriculture and forestry. As you know, a plant for example, it has resins, it has wax, it has protein, it has oil, it has latex. There are different compounds. There are different nutrients. Now we need to focus on those things and say, well, let me now start linking up to industry. So what the American society did was, in addition to reorienting their agriculture system, the researchers started looking for new species. They started looking at new land races, new wild races. Our ancient people have domesticated certain species for us and given us, we have been using those things. Our scientists have bred certain new species or new breeds of animals who are using those things, using those. Excuse me. But then there is something called biodiversity. In the biodiversity we have several species of animals, microorganisms, and plants. India, for example, is one of the most biodiverse countries. We are supposed to be having at least 86,000 species of animals, which of course includes microorganisms. We have at least 46,000 types of species in the, uh, the plant world. So far, we have used about 1.5 to 2 percent of the diversity. So look at the diversity that has remained untapped. We now need to start looking at those, those species, those wild races, those land races, which we have not yet taken advantage of, and then bring them into our practice, into our domain. So as we do this thing, just as America did in the 1980s, in 2020 and henceforward, we now need to start looking at agriculture, not just to a limited market of food grains or fruits and vegetables, but much beyond that. So what does this mean? It only means that while agriculture has sustained human civilization for the last 10,000 years, and it is doing today as seen from large percentage of the majority section of Indian society depending on agriculture for livelihood. Tomorrow is the time for agriculture, for a new agriculture, where agriculture is not looked at with, through sympathy, it is not looked at as a domain that needs charity of somebody. We need to look at agriculture as a robust domain which is capable of producing gainful employment for millions of people, 
and generating sustainable incomes for our people. So that is the new agriculture. And you all as students of agriculture sciences must remember that science is fundamental. Without science, we are condemned into the dustbins. Any society that has forgotten science has regressed. India is the best example. I told you India and China together in 1850 were the two largest economies. The Western world was nowhere compared to us. But what has happened in just 200 years? You don't stand anywhere relative to what we were. And one of the reasons is that we did not give so much of importance to science as the Western world gave. So science is very much important. Technology is nothing but the daughter of science. But basic science, applied science, are what have to be given due importance all the time. So you must remember that you have a vast scope in days and years to come. For the next 30 to 40 years of your professional career, you have so much to do. New hypotheses, new research problems, new requirements. And those who want to be outside the research domain, let's say administration, politics, etc., policies are going to be formulated. Even you need to reorient yourself to meet the new demand. In that context, I would like to tell you the epithet of Annadatha, the giver of food, is good, it is very pleasing to the ears, but it, knows, it does no good to the economic rationale of the same man. As long as we continue to just call him Annadatha and place him on a pedestal and don't give him the profits that he should get, then it is meaningless. What we now need to do under the reoriented, new mandated agriculture system is to give him other names. Entrepreneur, of course, and promote his enterprise, of course. But as the last budget of Indian Union government, the Honorable Prime Minister called him Urja Data. One, one new name, Annadata to Urja Data. That means somebody who is now producing energy. How does he produce energy? His plants, which are which, which are nothing but the bio, the, the again once again the carbon-based commodities that can be converted into methane, ethanol from sugar cane. This renewable energy or tapping the solar energy on the farms. So now the farmer becomes the new energy producer, renewable energy producer. His field now becomes the energy sector, is a new power plant. So likewise he can become data of several things. So from Anandata, he moves on to somebody who is giving other kinds of commodities to, our world, to the world, to the economy, and is generating thereby new opportunities, new options of livelihood. I would like to emphatically say to you that agriculture was there, it is there, and tomorrow it is going to be the brightest spot. Given the fact that today all of us are talking about ecology, we need to now optimally reconcile the competing demands of economy and ecology. And this COVID situation has sort of awakened that particular mind among everybody. Everybody has now begun to realize the importance of ecology. That is now no more an esoteric subject where we just needed to discuss somewhere at the seminars and forget about it. Today, I think mankind has begun to realize that ecology is something integral to our life. Otherwise, it is challenging our very life on earth. How do we now reconcile ecology and economy in such that our economic growth happens consistently and simultaneously it is also 
is also simultaneously consist, I mean sustainable. If we can do that thing, that is going to give us a, a miracle solution. And we will be able to sustain life on earth. With, we have a greener space, a greener space on earth. We will have a more clean space on earth. We will have a more healthy life on earth. And simultaneously will also be generate employment opportunities and associated incomes therewith. So there is so much to tell you all about this. I only thought that as young minds, because you have now a new life ahead of you, those of you who are graduates and postgraduates and PhD scholars, or those of you who have started doing uh, your job as a researcher, you all must remember that you have a new field to contribute to the change in this world. Never be apologetic that you are a student of agriculture. I would like you to be proud that you are a student of agriculture sciences. I firmly believe that we have so much to contribute. We have so much to continue to make a basic change in the very civilization of this society on earth. So please do start reading, discussing, deliberating with open mind. Don't be closed minds and keep learning because there is no end to learning. And as you learn more and as you acquire new knowledge and apply it and, and then try to regurgitate it using the spirit of reasoning, that is the fundamental thing of science, the spirit of inquiry, you will be able to innovate, you will be able to invent, you will be able to discover. So invention, discovery, innovation, these three are very important. Innovation is not invention, neither is it discovery. Innovation is nothing but identifying the already known thoughts or findings and how to manipulate, maneuver those things to make them applicable in a new situation. So that innovation also will require because no need to invent the wheel all the time. But that also requires intelligence, that also requires open mind, unconventional approach to it. So science, agriculture science has so much to do. Like, let me tell you a dental fit. That agriculture, as I was telling you, gamut of several domains, subsectors like animal husbandry, livestock, fisheries, aquaculture. We have not paid much attention to these things. We need to pay due attention to those things. And then we need to move away from pure production to incomes. When I say incomes, please remember three variables. One is I increase the productivity through better technology and management so that I get more produce from the same given piece of land, same given unit of water, same one unit of cattle, and that's how the production becomes more and more for the same units. Second, I do it not at any cost. Yes, it is possible for me to get 150 tons of sugarcane per acre by spending irrational amount of money. No, we need to achieve optimal yields by ensuring that I'm using my inputs rationally. So cost of production is very important. That is the second variable. And third one is, how do you reach your produce to the market without compromising the quality and create a marketing environment where they are able to get remunerative prices on the produce. So these three variables, high production, low cost of production, remunerative prices. When these three variables are taken into account, we will be helping the farmers to generate net positive returns. And when that happens, we are generating more incomes for the farmers. So what does it mean? Look at agriculture as an agriculture value system. Pre-production, production, post-production. Post -production. Only then can we generate more incomes for the farmers. When you talk about green revolution, we are only talking about production segment. And that is now exemplified, I mean the faultiness of that is exemplified, exemplified by the fact that a huge quantum of produce is going waste in our country as elsewhere. A 2012 study by CIFET, for example, showed us that 1 lakh crore worth of agriculture produce is wasted because we don't know how to take it to the market. 
We don't value logistics. We don't know how to handle it. And that study finding was actually very conservative. I would say it is many times that. If only we don't produce anything more but convert, save that that waste, we'll be generating at least one lakh crore money for our farmers. We therefore need to say not green revolution but income revolution. So can you all now starting to start talking in the country, farmers income revolution. We shall now look at incomes for our farmers, not just production. Whether it is a livestock sector, fishery sector, field top sector, or horticulture plantation, etc., etc. And when when the government committed itself to doubling farmers' income in 2016, after the vision of the honorable prime minister was shared with this nation. It was only to bring in this kind of transition, a paradigm shift in the way agriculture is practiced in this country. Our target is to double the farmers' income by 2022, but that's not the end goal. It's only one quantifiable time schedule target. What we are now looking at is how, on a sustainable basis, the incomes will continue to grow, and all of us. I mean, our country is committed to sustainable development goals 2030. There are at least seven agenda items in that list of 15, which are linked to agriculture. And two important things: to increase the productivity, to increase the health of the consumers, to improve the incomes for the farmers. These are the three important stuff. So when you say productivity increases, obviously we are talking about it. Income product income enhancement is what sustainable development goal talks about, and lest agriculture be accused of looking only for about thinking about only itself, let's be also very clear that we are here to look at the interests of the consumers because the entire country, entire world is a consumer class, including the farmers. In India, though we are food secure, we are not nutrition secure. So better to call it as nutrition security and not just food security. And when we talk of nutrition security, we have got macronutrients and micronutrients. We have got carbohydrates, we have got proteins, we have got fats as macronutrients. Under the micronutrient class, we have got the minerals, vitamins, and amino acids. We now therefore need to start producing even those kind of produce which will meet the nutritional requirements of our population, so that the health of our people increases. If the people are healthy. Then it's a prophylactic measure. There's no need for they will they will they will be more there will be more of uh, immunity in their system. Then they will fall sick again and again. Then the expenditure on health will reduce. So we need to build that kind of a society which is healthy, nutritious. Particularly when we're talking about demographic dividend in our country, the young population, the children, were all working class, work, work, work uh, possible class, productive class. So we have many responsibilities to meet the nutrition requirement of our people, incomes for our people, farmers, and ecological requirements for our society as a whole, the world as a whole, the earth as a whole. So how do we finally optimal optimize the interests of the consumers, interests of the farm, our farmers, interests of our ecology? I think that's the biggest challenge. And then one lifetime will not be enough for you. To find answers to these things, so you have so much more to do, friends. All let's all work together, and then take the whole thing forward. So thank you very much. Let me end up here. Once again, wishing you all happy Mother's Day. The biggest tribute that you all can pay to your mothers is by being a good citizen, someone who has sympathy, empathy, and compassion for others, somebody who does his karma all the time. And Not just waste his time, and finally, that during the COVID challenging times, let's all be very responsible citizens, responsible human beings. Do all that we're supposed to do, and also do something to others around us. So, thank you very much, and wishing each one of you the very best. God bless. Can I ask some questions? Ask him. What is it? So I answer them, is it? Yes. Okay, friends. Thank you. I can see in the box some.
comments and questions here. I can see Rajiv Kalaskar, she's saying, hi sir, like, hi Rajiv, thank you very much, nice seeing you too. And Sonika Priyadarshini says, nice to hear you, sir, after a long time. Likewise, it's my pleasure to be connecting with you all youngsters. And then I can see here Ganesh Shrede, he says, sir, I'm a student of agriculture economics. I have some questions regarding increasing efficiency of small and marginal farms. Okay, let me tell you a bit about this efficiency of small and marginal farms. Now, it is a misconception, a wrong perception, a wrong belief that small and marginal farms are not efficient. In fact, if you look at the average yields, we will always find that small and marginal farms are giving us better yields, that will better productivity compared to the large farms. One of the reason is that the farmer manager pays personal attention and then ensures that he is achieving good deals. When we say small and marginal farms are a problem in Indian agriculture, that is also true. It is true not because it is less efficient, it is true because the volume of production is so low despite high productivity that they are not able to make profits. As you know, scales, as a student of agriculture economics, you will appreciate, scales of operations or economy of scales of operations is very important. We'll be able to achieve economy or efficiency on the scales of operations provided it is large. Because we'll be able to buy inputs at a rational cost, we'll be able to use inputs more rationally, we'll be able to harvest in a more scientific manner, will be able to transact by carrying to the markets more efficiently. Now in case of small and marginal farmers, despite his productivity being high, the volume of produce is so small that both input management and output management are not as efficient. And the profit depends upon the volume of transactions, whether in industry or service or agriculture, higher the volume of transaction, better is the probability of getting profits. So since 86% of India's farmers are small and marginals, we find that they are not getting as much profit as they should be getting. So please you refer to various studies where it has shown that the, uh, the yield levels are much better in small and marginal farmers. Okay, so I will stop it at that. You can do more of research and find out. So this will only give you an idea as to where you should be focusing on. So we need to mobilize farmers into farmer producers organizations. We need to have more collectives, more of service contracts, contract farming, where the farmers continue to own their land, but simultaneously, collectively, they are operating by buying inputs together, by selling their produce together. So that's how we can bring scales of the economy to the operations of agriculture, even in case of small marginal farmers. Okay? I hope it satisfies you. Then I can now see Karbasaya Swami. No focus, need to integrate all ministries like agriculture, horticulture, sericulture, rural development, etc. into one ministry. Yes, and you have a point, Karibasaya. What you are saying is agriculture, particularly in the Indian context, particularly at the level of the small farmer, it is not monocropping that is required, it is not mono activity, it is integrated farming. He produces field crops, he grows some horticulture, some cattle, etc. And then what you're saying is that different ministries and departments which are supposed to be integrating sometimes fail to do so. Now, there are two things that we must remember. One is that there is also what is called functional specialization. Crops and horticulture require one kind of specialization, animal husbandry requires some other specialization. Because Begin with, to begin with, both in the state and the center, we all were under only one department. You know, when you say Krishi Bhavan in India, in Delhi, Krishi Bhavan means agriculture ministry had all departments under that, including rural development, forestry including, okay, fertilizers, chemicals and fertilizers, everything was there. But then, over a period of time, there was a need to separate these things because each had its own focus in terms of research, in terms of technology, management, policies. Now, in forestry, for example, so important, if it was a part of agriculture ministry, it may have not got the due 
focus that it deserves. Like today, we have a new Ministry of Animal Husbandry, which was still last year part of the Ministry of Agriculture. And generally it was seen that animal husbandry livestock was not getting that much of importance or attention as crops and horticulture were getting. So therefore, there has been some necessity for that. But simultaneously, it's also important how do we coordinate. So I think what we all need to do at state level and central level, while we work in different ministries, we also have some kind of a convergence, coordination, cooperation in our management and approach. So many a time here in Delhi, our Honorable Prime Minister keeps talking about convergence and coordination. He asks a group of the secretaries of different departments to work together, come out with an action plan. So likewise, I think at state level also, we all not need to start working. And in fact, in our DFI report, we have suggested that at the state level, there should be a coordination committee where all the ministries come together, including water resources, rural development, agriculture, horticulture, forestry, and likewise at the district level, all of them work together so that there can be a comprehensive plan there can be more rational use of resources, manpower and inputs, etc. I, I, I agree with you and I think we need to move towards that. Somehow we are not very good in that, unfortunately. We now need to take that thought forward. Okay, then Kola or Ramesh? Is it Ramesh? Yeah, I think or Ramesh. So doubling of farmers' income will be a daydream unless government of India addresses marketing issues and make a geographical specific crop plan. So you are talking about two things, Ramesh. You are saying one is to have, we need to have crop alignment, right? That means according to a climate, we have crop alignment. And simultaneously, what you are saying is cluster-based approach to crop production. And second, you are talking about the marketing. I would like to assure you that on both these fronts, the government of India is working very closely with the state governments. One, to be more specific, we are now trying to promote agroecology-based agriculture production. Then we are now working on 50 cluster de developments, that is one district, one crop, that is the new mantra. So based on the agroclimatic condition of a particular district and its suitability for a particular agricultural activity, we would like to clusterize the production system there and then link it up with markets. As regards marketing, several initiatives have been taken in the post-production. Let us say for example, Iran or the new agriculture market, the model agriculture and livestock marketing act that we have shared with the state governments. We are now committed to farmer producers organization to set up, to promote at least 10,000 FPOs. We have a new act on contract farming. We are now, the government of India in its 2018 budget said, APMCs are not sufficient because they are only wholesale markets. A large number of farmers are not able to go to wholesale, plus they are also very far. So now government is committed to setting up 22,000 number of grants, what are called Grameen Agriculture Markets. They are nothing but aggregation platforms. Within 6 to 7 kilometers from the farm gate, there shall be an aggregation platform with all facilities for storage, cleaning, grading, packing, etc. Where the farmers come with the produce, aggregate that thing and then take up marketing. So we have several initiatives and the marketing, you know, one nation will market concept with the ENAM. Reforms in agriculture markets, APMCs today have become zamindars. So now we are selling a new act, APMCs shall confine their authority to the boundary walls. So that if the farmer comes to the market, you, you guide it. You try to find a price, a good price for him. But if he wants to sell outside to somebody else, don't stop him. So this reform, which was not in agriculture has begun. So several initiatives have been taken. We are strengthening agri logistics, for example, integrated cold chain, processing facilities are being strengthened. So all the issues relating to post harvest management are being addressed. So you should be happy and I'm sure you should be start we should start seeing good results in due course of time. Then I can see Darshan here. Darshan I attend your discussion forum in Gujarat, Vibrant Gujarat. Good to hear you. Thank you very much, Darshan. Yes, I was there at uh, Vibrant Gujarat. It's a wonderful event and it is so nice to see there farmers and experts and opinion makers and industry, trade, everybody coming together on one platform. I too enjoyed. We'll keep meeting Darshan. All the best to you. Chandrasekhar, Soman Gaud, 
Good evening, sir. Thanks for your time and talk. What is one big reform we want to take up to increase farmer income? What are the specific plans for land consolidation? Reforms to bring scale. Yes. As far as scales or consolidating land is concerned, as you know, we don't want to compromise the ownership of land because that is one of the major assets the people have in this country. Simultaneously, this is a farm size has become too small and scales will run when you are not there. The government of India has shared what is called a Model Land Lease Act. That means the farmers should be able to legally lease out the land to somebody else without the threat of losing his ownership. Because today, under the State Revenue Act, if you were land has been leased to somebody else and that man can prove that he has been cultivating the land for a certain period of time, then he automatically becomes the owner because tiller is the owner of the land under the current revenue acts. So the model act of leasing that government of India has shared with the states is to say, let us not compromise the ownership of the land, but simultaneously allow farmers to start you know, legally, legally letting it out. So that is one thing that government of India has done and slowly some states like Uttar Pradesh for example has already enacted a new uh, law to this effect and other states are doing. And one big reform that you are talking about, several things I told you, the post harvest management I think is the biggest reform happening in this country. After decades where agriculture had been controlled, now it is being freed. So when we introduce that kind of liberation, liberalization, allow competition, then you will see that competition is going to bring about reform because private sector will make investments, there will be competitiveness and the farmers will also start benefiting from it. So I think that's what it is then. Okay, then Ramesh, yes, okay. Then we have uh, Ganesh Reddy, I spoke I think already. Yeah, Ganesh is talking about how to reduce cost of cultivation. Yes, once again, there are two ways of improving the cost of cultivation, uh, uh, bringing efficiency to cost of production. One is all our inputs, fertilizers, pesticides, etc., etc., water, etc. Our cost of manufacturing those things must reduce again through competition. Second one is our distribution channels must be efficient so that the farmers are able to access in a competitive mode. And most important is that technology must improve so that we are able to use the minimum. For example, micro irrigation system. If you simply use micro irrigation, the water use efficiency improves by at least 50% as a technology. If you add sensors to that, you will bring in greater efficiency. If you have, for example, combining fertilizer application through micro irrigation, you will reduce the use of fertilizers. If you adopt soil health card, evidence based fertilizer management for the farms, you use only that nutrient which is required and not a blanket approach. So, I think technology and management practices combined with new technologies is the answer to reduce the cost of cultivation. And of course, if the yield levels increase, then naturally, the cost of production decreases. What is there is a difference between cost of cultivation and cost of production. Cost of cultivation is how much money you spend for one acre, for example. But cost of production is how much money you spend per unit of yield. Let us say Punjab farmer grows 5.2 tons of paddy per hectare, and our Odisha farmer farmer grows 2.7 tons per hectare. Now, naturally, because the yield levels are high in Punjab. The cost of production is there is much less compared to Odisha. That is the meaning. Okay, so increase the productivity. Then subject matter specialist Jagdish, Agriculture Extension KBK IIHR Tumkuru. Okay, ICR Indian Institute. Okay, Jag, what is the uh, okay? Uh, Shankar Reddy. I couldn't understand the meaning of Jagdish. This is happiness. Good. Okay, thank you, Jagdish. Then Dr. Ganesh, uh, sharing. Yes. Agriculture markets are, are dominated by demand. Yes, now we are thinking of direct sale. So that disintermediation happens. Let's say somebody buys an Amazon platform, for example, right, in other commodities. Likewise, agriculture can have its own online trade platform where the farmer is directly able to offer it to the potential purchaser. So the disintermediation happens. But if that is to happen, we need to have quality consciousness. Okay, so that the, producer, the purchaser knows what he is producing. I mean, what he is purchasing, what quality, what grade of fruit or vegetable or grain is purchased. So, if we want direct trade to happen using the online trade platform, I think it is very important that we 
have to have quality grades and standardization. The quality consciousness is still not there among our farmers. Farmers still don't think that if I produce a better quality, I can get a better price. So our marketing reform has to ensure that we play premium, place premium on the quality produce. And simultaneously, the, we need to help the farmer to do that. I think that awareness is coming and government is looking at that thing. Then we have Shankar Reddy, localized processing setup and post harvest management is major requirement. Yes, it is one of the important requirements. That processing, what does processing do? The primary processing where you simply clean, grade and pack your commodities will get you better rates on your raw material. But when you talk of processing where physical chemical transformation of the agriculture produce happens, for example, tomato to ketchup, for example, then it gives you the advantage of time and space. Because you have processed it, the storage life, shelf life increases, now you can transport it across the world. What you produce today, you can sell it tomorrow. So processing is very important, both food processing and non-food processing. Okay. Then uh, we have uh, Amayogi. Amayogi Purva says, Good evening, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Amayogi. All the best to you. Arvind, of course, is my great younger friend who himself is highly committed to agriculture. He is a student of agriculture. I think for all of you others must know that Arvind Padi he is a PhD from IRI. He has been the director of agriculture in Odisha, working with Ikrisat, and he makes very constructive contributions to policy formulation. To share with you one particular example, two years back when he was a member of the group of secretaries, he said, sir, people, I mean farmers use fertilizer by bats, they don't go by vehement. They buy a 50 kg urea and just add it, though it may not be required. So why not we reduce or rebag it from 50 kg to 45 kg. Government accepted that and today we have urea which is 45 kg bag. So the farmer <laughs> does not understand, of course he is paying less now certainly, but simultaneously he doesn't think he is using less, he is using correctly. So this is just one single uh, policy decision that was based on his excellent suggestion. I want to, I want to tell you that there are many agriculture students in different domains who are doing human uh, service. Thank you Arvind and please continue with your aggressive education and orientation for society. Shikant Dharma, excellent talk. Thank you very much Shikant. Is my Saikant, so sorry. So I can't thank you very much and it is always my pleasure to talk with and interact with youngsters like you. Parushram, Dr. Parshram Patroti, nice talk, says thought provoking. Thank you very much. Same thing, Parshram. Let's all get keep working. Raju, Raju Tagali, eye opening talk, sir. Thank you very much. You are now, let's, as they say, you know, Sun Yat Sen said, each one teach one in China in 1911. That's how China became more educated than us in a shorter period of time. So, one, I speak with you, Arvind speaks with you, you speak to another person. This is how the chain reaction, positive chain reaction will be set up. Let's continue with that. Dr. Ganesh Reddy, reducing cost of cultivation is different thing and MSP is different. Yes, certainly. MSP, minimum support price and procurement, you should depend upon that only when market forces do not discover good prices. Now, how it is very difficult for any government to keep procuring. Even if you procure everything, what do we do with that? So, more important is that we strengthen reform our market forces such that the farmers are able to realize good prices in the market. Since agriculture cannot be a perfect market, you know what is a perfect market. It can never, there can be no market which is perfect and much less in agriculture. So we will require some government support once a while because fluctuations will be there. So we must focus on strengthening our markets and simultaneously have the support of the government for MSP based procurements sometimes. Then we have, uh, okay, we have got Amayogi, thank you sir, then Parshram, okay. Then uh, we have Jyoti, Jyotirmai Balla, post-Covid might be a matter of survival rather than the matter of prosperity. In that case, will government encourage farmers to take up ZPNF? See, it's like this. What is ZPNF? Basically, you're talking natural farming. In, these are, is one technology. We, can, we also need conservation agriculture. Conservation agriculture are different forms. We've got organic farming, we've got natural farming, Many a time people talked about Vedic farming, etc, etc. Primarily what has happened is that India in the last 50 years has lost a lot of carbon. Soil organic carbon is extremely important. 
as you know soil structure there is our soil structure and soil fertility soil structure is so important and structure can be good provided by a good organic carbon unfortunately the average percentage of soil organic carbon is reduced to 0.3 in our country even in those regions where forests are there where high canopy cover is there even there it could be one maximum or 1.5 in certain malnad belts of karnataka for example but then the fact that most rain fed areas punjab for example the indo gangetic belt of which is a food basket of our country organic carbon is reduced so when people talk about organic farming natural farming primarily they are talking about improving the organic soil organic carbon so we will be continuing to promote all kinds of technologies okay but the short point is that all of us must say that we will focus more on soil and water management based on evidence our testing water we use that water after testing our soils we add so nutrients with fertilizers or organic manures the push need to what the evidence is so i think the focus should be that okay and don't say that it's not going to be an age, age of prosperity every crisis gives rise to new management new responses new technologies look at the way now government of india is now bringing out so many reforms what does it show that it wants to enable the farmers and the country to prosper so i think you know 1991 when we had the crisis of balance of payment india reformed its economy and thanks to that liberalization and privatization and openness indian gdp grew so massively we we left behind what was negatively called as hindu growth rate okay so likewise i think today's situation i firmly believe is going to uh, enroll several reforms in agriculture and go to place agriculture in fast track be sure about that okay then okay all thank you raju thank you ganesh shankar getting back to roots in agriculture in other areas yes, certainly go back to agriculture mean you need not be a farmer only but go back to the roots of agriculture science the roots of management principles and how do we reorient the agriculture that has been there for the last 10000 years then we have got ashok director of cards tnau hi ashok how are you the nice seeing you at your university you are focusing on agri enterprise i have been telling everybody what you are doing in your center that every agriculture university now must focus on you know post harvest enterprise build up for all the youngsters i think you are an example and uh, maybe i'll take another opportunity to come down to tnau is a great university and uh, one of the oldest and the best universities at par with several others of course so please convey my regards to all your colleagues and your vice chancellor and then zaheer ahmed a nice talk sir yes zaheer thank you very much and yes <laughs> like integrated farming okay integrated university you are right that you know even universities also not start like as we talked about departments and ministries there no use of functional uh, facts you know Uh, what is it called as a fragmentation of the universities i certainly think that we need to bring them together but simultaneously each university must become a center of excellence for something for example there can be an university of agriculture and horticulture there can be two universities one university is focusing on horticulture another university on agriculture again one university may be focusing on rain fed agriculture another on irrigation systems so i think it is important that agriculture science universities get together but simultaneously they also become centers of excellence so i think that we will be able to reconcile some demand for disintegration and another demand for integration so it is the, it is it that's the thing but more importantly the universities themselves must create a platform to work together because each of them has got a particular agro ecological zone how do they share research how do they share resources like where online teaching is going on in universities let us say we don't have a professor of econometrics in a particular university but he is there in another university now we should be able to take advantage of that professor of econometrics to teach here biotechnology are just examples so i think their merit lies today's technology enables us to share resources we should start sharing okay thank you so ramulu thank you very much for your comments tapan thank you very much please give special attention to odisha certainly see in fact you know we have program for eastern india including odisha let me tell you odisha is making a very good progress upon in fact since 2005 6 
the growth rate of agriculture in Odisha has been commendable. Let us take fishery for example, one of the, one of the you know, good uh, domains. Odisha's fishery grew at 36%, the highest anywhere in the country. And there are, there are excellent offices, excellent policy support from government. Odisha is a rising state, let me tell you. And it is going to soon occupy a, its rightful place in the, in the, in the, among the states of our country, certainly. And people like you should be contributing to the Then Shankar Reddy, make water conservation mandatory. Yes, certainly. As you know, Minister of Jal Shakti today is focusing on water use efficiency and tapping all sources of water and promoting uh, scientific principles and settle that will happen. Tapan, can we use artificial intelligence? Yes, artificial intelligence, I told you emerging technology, artificial intelligence, IOT, WOT, sensors, big data analytics, space science, these are all the buzzwords but they are practical, uh, they are of practical importance and utility in agriculture sector. We will have to bring technology, without technology we will not be able to move forward. So that you keep in mind. Then Arun, sir, reducing middlemen. Yes, certainly middlemen. I told you disintermediation has to happen, whether on the input side or the output side. Now using online trade platforms, we should be able to deliver inputs to the farmers at cost efficiency and likewise find good prices for the produce uh, uh, through online trade and India is one is government of India is working on that. Then Ravi Chandran, how about replicating Jan? Jan Aushadi is like structure to provide generic farm chemicals in subsidized rate. Yes, I think you have a point in that, that how we can bring about generic. Uh, India has done very well in pharmaceuticals and I likewise I guess in pesticides also it can be done and there are some thoughts. I hope, let's hope that you will see the light of the day. We have again Ramachandran once again to have uniform marketing platform. Yes, ENAM, Electronic National Agriculture Market. Is a, is a single platform. Our Karnataka's runs is a single platform. What now we are doing is to create interoperability among different online trade platforms so that we are able to create one platform, one marketing space, one digital space for the farmers of this country to meet the new traders across the country. It is going slowly and steadily because we also need other support systems like I saying labs would require, we need better uh, you know, infrastructure for storage and transportation, there has to be seamless, trans for, for seamless transition, for example, from small vans to big trucks, from trucks to train, uh, trains, from trains to air, air to ship. So that seamless transition, all those things are to happen and I think in due course we will see all those things. Then I can uh, see here cold storage aspects, yes certainly integrated cold store. What has happened in the last 15 years is we created a large number of cold stores but we did not create as many number of pack houses. We did not create as many number of reefer vans. Like reefer vans, we need 60,000, we only have 10,000. There is a shortage of 95% of pack houses but we have enough capacity of cold stores. So what it means is, all of you please remember youngsters, that any problem can be solved only by an ecosystem approach. We can't tinker, tinker with one component of it. It has to be all components together. That is ecosystem approach. So that is that is whether it's cold store and agriculture as a whole. Okay. So please remember that. Then Hari Anant. Uh, oh, extension or Ravichan Rangan extension. Yes, we certainly need better extension. Extension has taken a back seat these days. We need to combine manpower based extension with technology based extension. Real time data has to be transferred to farmers. Where is the likelihood of pest and how is it going to behave? How the disease is going to behave? Is the epidemic likely to become, uh, is like is sporadic becoming epidemic, epidemic becoming endemic? So, real time data using new technology platforms, we need to have various kind of e platforms. And then Howard State comments, Hari, thank you very much, sir. You are always welcome to TNA. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, I've certainly come. Then, uh, Satvir Roti, what happened to agriculture is one of the subjects from 5th to 10th standard. I, yeah, I think, see, people have been talking, yes, I guess, I think, you know, there are so many things, you know, the young students are not just agriculture, they have to learn health, yeah, they have to learn ecology, they have to learn so many things, society, sociology. I guess there has to be some kind of an optimization where we teach everything, we just sow some seeds of thought, you know, class 1 to 10 is not for specialization, we just create interest in them. 
open their idea, minds to different subjects, creativity, etc. So yes, agriculture likewise, ecology likewise can go into that. Rajshekar Basnaik, Namaste sir, reply, thank you Rajshekar, nice seeing you. Muttaraj, Kotkar, County, collaborate CSI, yes, a very good sir, question you asked. Can CSI and ICR, yes, we should integrate. You know, I had been to uh, the CFTR Mysore uh, three years back. I asked, uh, this is one of the fantastic CSI labs, their uh, facility at Mysore Food Processing. I was asking, how much of connectivity do you have with the agriculture university? They said, nil. So sad. Agriculture is concerned with production. CS, um, CFTR is concerned with using that produce and very less connectivity. So I think CSI and ICR are two premier research bodies the top class research bodies in our country can certainly cooperate and I think there is some cooperation you know that we have we, as you know we have got a principal scientific advisor to uh, government and at his level some kind of co coordination does happen I guess more and more will certainly happen okay then uh, Tapan thank you Ravi Chandran as a rice farmer I could reduce water sustainability yes certainly yeah there's some you know that now direct seeding and then there are so many new technologies that have come in rice then you know, I think so it will reduce the water because water guzzler it is paddy. As you know, we use 3000 to 5000 liters to produce 1 kg of paddy. It is not an efficient crop in terms of water use. We certainly need to bring about rationalization, uh, rationality. Any reform will be brought to link Narega. Yes, already Narega, a lot of modification government has done and they have allowed a lot of activities like creating ponds. For example, last year, Almost one million number of small ponds were created in Narega on the farmers' fields. So that has given protective irrigation. In Karnataka, for example, they have got a very good program where these ponds are created, then the agriculture department gives them micro irrigation facilities. And I went and saw a lot of farmers were able to save their crop even during the drought situation only because they were able to offer protective irrigation. And this happening all over the country. Telangana, they are doing such a good work about other Kakatiya system of thing, Odisha is doing, all states are doing and certainly in the government of India has set up a committee so how Narega can be linked to uh, agriculture so government is aware and they are working. Israel agriculture farming technology, see what is Israel agriculture technology? Basically to use soil efficiently, to use water efficiently, bring in new technology so I think India is also doing a lot, watershed development is an effort towards that direction we have got centers of excellence in horticulture, etc. All to promote this kind of technology. But there is so much to learn from Israel because they have done very good progress. As you know, Israel, for example, half their country re receives just 20 millimeter of rainfall. Another half requires needs only uh, receives only 300 millimeter rainfall. Yet they are doing so much good in agriculture. That means resources have been used efficiently. Soil and water they have to be used efficiently. There is a point in that. Okay. Then Nagushan Gowder my, did my graduation from BSc Agriculture of US Daddy, uh, US AD. Yeah, yeah, good, good. I am also a student of US Harvard. Okay. <laughs> is it, and also US Bangalore, of course. Then is it possible to bring agriculture concurrently? Well, I think we will not talk about it. We will see how in India is trying to do something. We will see what to do. I will not talk about it here. Yeah. Replying to Dr. Ganesh, Siddharji, Dilip Rao, but I am sure that government will not declare MSP for inputs also. MSP cannot be declared for inputs. We can't regulate inputs. Okay, Though many times we do have under control orders, we, we say that this is the maximum price. But I think more important is to enable manufacture, etc. in India itself through ease of doing business such that they are able to produce the uh, inputs like pesticides at a more cost efficient level and make it available to farmers. Then, uh, okay, uh, Sidramappa Kalyan Shetty, what is the role of FPO in agriculture? So much, I told you, farmer producer organization will bring all the farmers together, will impart scales of efficiency. That means that is a group of farmers. Instead of buying their inputs individually, they all assess the requirement, go to market, buy and come and distribute among themselves. They want to sell their produce. They collect their aggregate the produce, go together. Instead of individually going in bullock carts and trucks, they will hire one truck, get all the produce. So this is how scales of efficiency are brought in. So FPOs have got a lot to contribute and that's why Government of India is now targeting 10,000 FPOs by 2022. Okay. Then uh, Satveer, okay, well, I think I answered him. I'm not happy with your answer, sir. Yes. You <laughs>
<laughs> See, I think we will discuss about the time or you call me sometime because the limitation of time I am not able to give you full uh, attention. Possibly I am not able to communicate. You call me sometime some other time and I will give you answer. Ravi Chandran, as farm get land gets fragmented continuously, the income also reduces proportionately. Yes, that's why we are saying Land Lease Act, legalizing land lease, farmers, producers, organizations, contract farming, etc. are being brought to solve this problem. But we all should also agree that if other sectors, industrial and service sectors grow more robustly, then people will shift from agriculture to those sectors. How long can agriculture continue to bear the burden of such huge population? We will have to reduce the people dependent on agriculture so that it becomes more efficient. Okay. Then, then Rajesh Kumar. Uh, oh, namaste sir. Where is Rajesh? Okay. Technology transfer is not happening properly. Farmer needs stably supply of seeds water. Yes, certainly we agree with you. We not need to focus on the seed supply management and extension management. Okay, then Ravichandran once again, what is the future of GMO? Yes, I think that is something that we certainly need to look at in the GMO sector as you know the food crops and non-food crops. The food crops, there are different, you know, uh, is, you know, issues. There is an ethical issue. Many people say that you know, we should not be tinkering with the basic DNA structure and we don't know what's going to happen in terms of its impact on health, etc. But at least on the non-food sector, I guess there's not so much of uh, opposition to that stuff. But I think we will, for example, cotton, it has now only gained so much of ground over the last 15 years. And I think slowly now that's opening up and we'll see what happens. Uh, it's something. Okay. Okay, okay, we're we'll now trying to finish it off quickly. No more questions, I guess. We can all meet up again. I say the government support which integrates knowledge of agriculture, the food technology. Yes, there is a support. Now, food processing ministry and the agriculture ministry, CSIR, ICR, they're all will be coming on one platform to work together. Average age of farmers is 45 years. How to entice them? Uh, I, I was not able to understand you, but uh, what you are saying is that 45 is a good age for anybody to work, right? I mean, uh, that means what you are saying is why youngsters are not coming. That's what you are meaning, and now I get it. Now, yes, let the youngsters come into agriculture, but as I told you, that we have too many people in agriculture in any way. I would be very happy if more people shift out of agriculture. But those farmers, uh, those people who remain in agriculture must use new technology. So, youngsters possibly can even use technology. But I think, imagine. How many? 48 percent. 14 crore farm families in the country are 141 million hectares. Today only somebody shared with me and I have the data that in Asia, the per hectare land is the lowest, 1.3 or 1.1 hectare. And it goes on from Asia to Africa. Africa is higher than us. It goes to Europe, Europe to America, highest per hectare land area. Because they have less people more robust manufacturing industry sector. So I think in India also we now need to uh, see how we can you know, start shifting out people. Okay, so whenever people say people don't want to come to agriculture, I don't understand what they're trying to say. There are enough people already in agriculture. So give new knowledge to the people who are in agriculture, enable technology access, credit access, input access, marketing access, so that they do it more efficiently. So don't worry, let's see how we can move on. But as I told you, a new system of agriculture linked to industry will be able to generate better opportunities. Secondary agriculture is very important. That means how to use the raw materials to add value on the farm at the village. So please refer to secondary agriculture volume that we have written in our DFI report. It is there on the link www.agricoop.gov.in. That is our department's uh, web. Go there, look at the document doubling farmers income. You will see volumes 1 to 14. I think volume 9 refers to uh, secondary agriculture. So we need to now start promoting secondary agriculture along with primary agriculture. Okay, let's quickly finish now. Convergence of RDPR. Yes, we already talk, talked about it. Watershed. Yes, certainly. Watershed is a way forward for rainfall agriculture. And in fact, now we are working on new guidelines for watershed. And spring shed, we're not for, we had forgotten spring shed. You know, there are millions of spring sheds in the Himalayan state, and at least three million spring sheds have got dried up because of indiscreet use. We now need to treat them just like water sheds and revive those water bodies. Okay. Then, what is the future of organic products? Is there organic products? 
the future will be there for organic products if we are able to bring in new technology because yields also have to increase. We can't have low yields only. Organic produce based on organic systems of cultivation will survive provided we give new technology. The response of the crop to the organic inputs is also high just like response to in, uh, chemical fertilizers is there. But simultaneously we need branding, we need quality management, we need marketing systems etc. Then uh, how do you control cow bugs in cow pee? Oh, this is very specific uh, techno. I think I won't be able to answer that, uh, Ju. Okay, <laughs> you have to ask some pathologist or entomologist, I guess, or I mean, wet guy. Uh, I'm sorry, not wet, sorry, entomologist. Uh, so I won't be able to answer that. Then, the issue of why government is not removing GST. Okay, see, you know, GST has just come in. Most of our agriculture related inputs and outputs, they're all in zero segment. 5% slab and 12% slab. There are only one or two which are in 18% slab. I mean, government has done a lot. It we were in the initial stage and slowly there will be more and more rationalization as GSC gets more robust. I'm sure sectors related to agriculture will get better, uh, you know, uh, support in terms of lower slabs. Okay. So, mostly, but you still be happy that either in 0% or 5% slab even today. Right. Why government looks at industry people as aliens? Not at all. I don't know. I, if that is the impression, I think that is wrong impression. But anyway, we have a new, getting a new seed bill and that will be taken care of. Can there be offline transportation and storage linkage with ENAM like FCI? Not, see, we need more and more online, but simultaneously offline has to also happen. But offline can happen provided we also have good agri logistics where the farmers are able to move their produce. Suppose we have a system of direct trade where the purchases go and go to the village farm gate, that's what will be the new approach. Okay? Like we know. Today farmers have to go to market, now we want the market to go to the doorstep of the farmers. That will be a new approach, so that we are able to capture all the agriculture surpluses into the marketing system. Okay, then, Rajesh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your lovely comment. Uh, many universities who have technology are changing hefty for farmers, okay. Yes, I think that will be done in due course. I think there is agri innovate that we have got here in ICR and uh, that is I think trying to see how to rationalize all these things. What could be the doubled income for an average farmer? I will, now, how much? 2022 will tell you how it is going to grow, how much it will grow, but we are all aiming at doubling farmers' income vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis 2015. That is, see, 2016 is a base year. So, we are trying to double the income in real terms vis-a-vis -vis 2016, and we are on track, and I'm sure we'll achieve that. Your advice to seed industry. Uh, my only advice is that yes, we have to produce truthfully labeled seeds, quality seeds at competitive prices, you know, uh, uh, such that, see the farmers are able to get quality seeds, farmers are able to get seeds at low cost, I mean rational cost, because seed, a good seed ensures an increase of 25 to 30 percent in the yield levels. Seed is a seed of agriculture, let's remember that. So the greatest focus is, re is required on seeds. So, we should not have any spurious seeds, we should not have, you know, all kinds of uh, seeds which are not meeting quality standards and we need to increase our, uh, you know, the seed hubs and seed villages, etc. so that we are able to get uh, good quality, certified seeds, quality seeds and I think we also need to have seeds not according to the crop but according to the varieties. That means each agroecology according to the package of practices that the state universities are recommending are we producing that much of breeder seed, foundation seed? Are we producing that quantum of certified seeds that particular agroecology requires? I think we have not have gone to those uh, fine tuning. I think seed industry has to start looking at this. Okay, so I think we will now. Uh, COVID is believed in India would be a partner in international arena. Yes, COVID is now creating a situation where India is going to res respond and become. Uh, a, a competitor at the world level, India has got the opportunity of becoming a part of the global supply chain and uh, let's all work together for that. Thank you so much sir for your valuable time. Thank you Nath Bhushan. Thank you very much. So I think we will now close it here. So let me uh, thank you all for your patient hearing and thank you very much for your uh, very positive comments and it has been my pleasure to be with you. I missed the opportunity of being with you at your Jabalpur uh, convention. But today, I think I, I guess this time uh, has made up for that. So we'll keep meeting. All of you, all the best. Please dedicate yourselves to India's agriculture, India's ecology, farmers and consumers. Thank you very much.